Southern California, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. We have a big show ahead of us today, such as the Lakers. They actually did pretty good on their road trip despite not having LeBron and AD. Also, they might be getting Anthony Davis back pretty soon. Will that be enough to help the Lakers going forward? Or will they need LeBron as well? Clippers have been doing pretty solid as well. They're still in the top three of the Western Conference to everyone's dismay that's a Laker fan. But can they keep it up come postseason time? Also, the Angels kind of hit a rough patch against Kansas City, but they start a new series against the struggling Minnesota Twins. The Dodgers are on fire, as well as the Padres. They're still doing good as the two teams face one another in the epic NL West battle, the first of many battles that will be going on between the Padres and the Dodgers. Also, the Ducks and the Kings are still the Ducks and the Kings. But in other news, we have UCLA men's hoops getting richer as they got a couple good transfers and they got a commit from Windward, California. Who'd they get? And will that be enough? And USC also got a big time transfer from Memphis as well. Will the Chargers be able to replicate their success from this year? Also, we have one of the biggest high school football games going on this Saturday. Which game is it? We'll also throw in some NCAA women's volleyball news that's going on as it's NCAA tournament time. All that and more here on the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome, one, welcome all to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning on on this beautiful Friday afternoon. I am glad to be here. It's been somewhat of a long week, but we are here. It's Friday afternoon, and I am excited to get into this Southern California sports action. Without any further delay, let's get on into some SoCal sports action. But first, we have a word from two sponsors of ours. The first sponsor for iX Sports Radio is Legacy Financial. 2020 was a tough year, but staying positive, keeping your faith, and continuing to work hard is the goal. If you're in a financial struggle at the moment, you're doing well and you want to get to the next level, or you're looking for a new opportunity to work for yourself and earn more money part-time, give Io a call at 510-928-2104. That number again is 510-928-2104 to book your appointment today. Io and her husband, Andrew, are just two people on a mission helping families build a legacy because everyone in this world needs a legacy. You can follow them on Twitter at Legacy underscore Uncut, and you can follow them on Instagram at Sims underscore Uncut. The second sponsor for iSports Radio, and this one is actually a personal favorite of mine since it's in SoCal, <laughs> is Southern California Warriors, a semi-pro football team. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get film to try out for professional teams, big-time colleges, or playing to stay in shape. No matter what, semi all semi-pro athletes have one thing in common, and that's playing f for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether, in, whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi Sports, semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get the second chance you have been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter at SoCalWarriors on Instagram at SouthernCalifornia underscore Warriors and you can follow them on Facebook or like them on Facebook being Southern California Warriors. 
Thank you to our two sponsors for being the official sponsors of IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all the sports. You can follow IE Sports Radio on Twitter at IE Sports Radio, and you can follow them on Instagram at IE Sports Radio. And if you're on Facebook, just go to the search bar, type in IE, then the word sports, and then radio, and then boom, you have your you have your IE Sports Radio search. So good stuff right there. All right, now let's jump on into the Southern California sports action. So we'll start with some college basketball. I don't, I didn't want to talk college basketball, but just because it just recently ended and it's pretty much been a week since it's ended, but might as well get into some basketball news in terms of NCAA uh, men's basketball news. So I did hear that one of UCLA's men's basketball players, unfortunately, has medically retired i believe i don't know i forgot what his name was but i know he attended corona centennial but uh it is sad that he had to medically retire but i wish him the best going forward so there's that right there so the big news however for ucla men's hoops is that they got one college transfer and they got one commit as miles johnson a former rutgers center has officially declared that he will be attending UCLA to further his his studies and play men's basketball for the Bruins, which is absolutely amazing. So, Miles Johnson is a 6'11 center from Rutgers, which is absolutely amazing. And he's also got a 7'7 seven seven wingspan, which is really amazing. He brings a lot of shot-blocking pressure for, to UCLA. And the the guy that uh that uh medically retired was Jalen Brown. Or not Jalen Brown, Jalen Hill. So So there's that. So that's really cool that they got Miles Johnson. That really helps the Bruins out tenfold. And I think that's gonna be something really amazing for them going forward. And then just recently today Dylan Andrews from a point guard from Windward High School who plays for the Windward High School boys basketball team announced that he is committed to UCLA. He is a four-star recruit and he's one of the top players ranked nationally in his position. So it's really amazing that UCLA is actually getting a lot of good bolstering. They're, they're bolstering their roster and it really shows because in case they have they have like a safety net in case uh, players want to transfer or players just want to move on from basketball or if players want to declare for the NBA draft because anything is possible and UCLA's players have proven that they are legit and getting getting Johnson is going to be really amazing because. Because having that big man presence is going to be huge, especially in a tough conference such as the Pac-12. And yes, the Pac-12 is considered tough. And and he was also a member of the Big Ten Conference defensive team. So that's absolutely amazing. And, jo- and uh, Johnson actually starred at Long Beach Poly. And he actually picked UCLA over Stanford... And then he, in terms of transferring after after being with uh with Rutgers, so I'm glad he's going to be coming back to California. Johnson averaged eight points, eight and a half rebounds per game. He averaged two point four blocks in twenty four, little under twenty five minutes per game. So he's really going to solidify his presence in the offensive and defensive court for for UCLA, which also has Cody Riley, Mac Etienne, and Kenneth Nwuba. So, absolutely amazing. So, Andrews is actually the fifth best player in California in his class, courtesy of 24-7 Sports, and he is ranked 21st nationally, which is absolutely amazing. If he's the fifth best player, then UCLA has been UCLA has been really good. Like, they're also getting Peyton Watson from Long Beach Poly as well. So, I really am thinking that this UCLA team is going to be something special, especially in the near future. Like, 
Like, if they were able to get to the Final Four with the team that they had, the team that straight up struggled down the stretch, they could be in for a for something even better, which is absolutely amazing. And, like I said, Andrews is the fifth best player in California, and he's ranked 21st nationally, which is absolutely amazing. And he's known for being a versatile player who has been readily shifting between passing and scoring, and he puts the team first because he is a team player. And according to his coach, Col- Colin Plath, he says, Dylan's style is a blend of aggressive playmaking with a high skill set that makes him extremely hard to guard. His athleticism and competitive spirit equates to winning at any level. Dylan Andrews is an absolute pleasure to coach. That says a lot right there. And and to believe it or not, Andrews is actually the second player from the class of 2022 to commit as he's joining Amari Bailey, who is a combo guard from Sierra Canyon. So that's quite amazing right there. So UCLA is really shaping up. And and I thought uh, – I, I didn't know he was a – junior i thought he was a senior but that's my bad i don't think i ever said his grade level anyway but but ucla is really preparing for the future and i am all for it even though i'm a usc guy speaking of usc so usc has also been in the news partially for good reasons and partially for bad reasons we'll start with the bad first so Unfortunately, on Thursday, USC received an NCAA decision of self-imposed penalties, and they they got two years probation. Now, it's not a postseason ban, so USC still is can still make the postseason, whether it's like NIT or any of those things. But they do have uh, penalties. They, they According to the press release, it says the NCAA Division One Committee on Infractions accepted self-imposed sanctions and put USC men's basketball on two years probation after making a finding that a for- that a former men's volleyball or men's basketball assistant coach violated NCAA ethical conduct rules. And it's like, of course, and I and I looked at this, I'm like, of course it's USC. Why am I not surprised? In a detailed public report, they concluded that the former assistant coach operated on his own and without the knowledge of any other university or athletics personnel. The NCAA acknowledged the university displayed exemplary cooperation and self-imposed significant and meaningful penalties in line with the NCAA membership's penalty guidelines. The former assistant coach received a three-year show cause. The NCAA press release is available on its website, which I won't get into. And then we've got a statement from Mike Bond, the athletic director of USC, and then a quote, or, or then a, a quote from Andy Enfield, the coach of USC. So at least it's not a postseason ban. That is something I will say. At least USC can still make the postseason. But I just hate this whole thing. It's like, come on, USC. Why do you? Go, why does this have to happen? Like, USC has one of their best seasons in team history, and then this happens. It's like, gosh dang it. Uh, USC will never change, I guess. Um, there's also some other news that USC was involved in. But don't worry, it's not as bad as this. So USC just got word earlier today that Evan Mobley has declared for the 2021 NBA draft. So USC won't be seeing Evan Mobley anymore. And Evan Mobley's about to spread his wings and live out his dream and hopefully do big things in the NBA. I really wish he could have stayed for one more year, but I think Evan will be, I think Evan needs to spread his wings. He and Tajidi are also, Tajidi also said he's declaring for the NBA draft. Some people say he's not ready. Well, I say this. I think he's ready. But Evan Mobley is definitely ready. He is projected to be a top 10 pick. I think he'll be top 10 or top 5. Some people are saying he'll be the number 1 pick, but uh, I don't know. I think Evan Mobley needs to bulk up a little. If he bulks up, then this dude, Evan Mobley, is going to be a 
beast when he gets into the NBA. And I am all for it. I definitely wish Evan Mobley the best. I hate how his last game of the season with USC was a complete dud and a complete drag drag out courtesy of Gonzaga. But but at least he's going to get the chance to play in the NBA, make some money, and live out his dream. So I wish nothing but the best for Evan Mobley. Um, also, before I get into the next bit of news for USC, USC was a top 15 offense and defense this year as they joined Gonzaga, Houston, Illinois, and Michigan as teams that were top 15 in both offense and defense. USC was ranked number two defensively while they were ranked 14th offensively, which is pretty cool, actually. I actually did not know that until I saw the news, and I'm like, okay, cool. So there is that right there. But the biggest news for USC came on on the 12th of April, meaning it was a Monday, and... When I saw this news, I was really surprised and really happy. Boogie Ellis, a a former Memphis men's basketball standout, has decided to transfer from Memphis and attend USC to further his education and play men's basketball, which to me is absolutely amazing. Okay, it's not that amazing, but still... That's absolutely huge for USC, considering USC needs a good point guard. So that's awesome that USC is going to be able to have that type of player at their disposal. So good for you, good for them. Like, and they they're going to need as many transfers and t- talent players, talented players as they can get. Because if UCLA is going to is is in the market for getting top notch guys, USC needs to follow suit. Otherwise, they won't be having another. Elite Eight run for a while because teams like that come once, maybe twice in a blue moon for USC. Um, I guess to round off the other USC men's basketball news, uh, Chavez Goodwin is coming. I think it's, that's how his first name is pronounced. Chavez 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 Goodwin is coming back to USC, which is awesome. I think he's one of those hardworking players and. He's a dog. He doesn't. It doesn't show on the stat sheet, but he always plays good defense. So good to see Goodwin coming back. And he all. And whenever he does get open, he always throws the ball down, and he's a threat in the paint. So yeah, he's taking the bonus here, and he's going to make one more run with USC. And I am all for it. So good for him. Good for him. So. And I guess more USC men's basketball news. Uh, DeMar DeRozan has signed with the Miami Heat, which is cool. So that's going to do it for all the USC and UCLA men's hoops news. So I'm just glad USC is starting to try to load their bases when it comes to having more talent. But I will also say this, UCLA is doing everything it can to prepare for the future and then some. Like and I am all for it. Like if they continue to do this, then they'll be back in the final four, if not the championship game in no time. So keep doing you, UCLA, and you too, USC. Just hopefully y'all can meet in the championship game next year. So there's that. All right, so enough about some college hoops. Let's go to the pro hoops. Let's go to NBA action. So the Lakers and the Clippers have been going on this season, and they will both be able to have fans. And the Lakers actually had fans last night as they took on the Boston Celtics, and unfortunately for them, they lost 121-113. to They had 2,000 fans, and those 2,000 fans were able to boo the Celtics, <laughs> which is funny. I think having fans back at the against the Celtics was probably the biggest mistake ever. I think that I think the Lakers need to do a better job of like picking their opponents on who they should have in terms of these special nights. Like championship ring night against the Clippers that did not go well. The Clippers wound up winning. Fan retur- 
the fans returning night where fans actually got to attend the Lakers game against the Celtics, that didn't go well either. Like, it seems like the opponents that for the Lakers that are scheduled on these special nights always seem to, like, use that as motivation to, like, beat the Lakers. Gosh dang it, Lakers. Like, why do you got to do this to us? Anyway, I think on May 12th, the Lakers will be unveiling their banner. Luckily, they'll be playing a team that they know they most likely can beat, and that's the Houston Rockets. And the Rockets have been god-awful this year. Ah, poor Houston. Anyway, back to the Lakers. So the Lakers actually concluded their seven-game road trip. So this past Tuesday, the Lakers defeated the Charlotte Hornets 101-93. to On Monday, the Lakers lost to the New York Knicks 111-96. to And then on Saturday, or this past Saturday, the Lakers defeated the Brooklyn Nets 126-101, to which was very impressive, even though Brooklyn didn't have all of their players and eventually one of their players retired medically retired and then i guess it's and then i guess it's worth noting that last last thursday even though i talked about this the lakers lost to the heat 110 to 104 i'm just going to say this to you heat fans congrats on your revenge win big freaking whoop you didn't beat us when it mattered most last year and i'm not saying that just to be bitter i'm just saying that because it is the truth you want to I'm right here. We can meet anywhere. Yes. Yes, sir. Big truss. Woo woo. I'm kidding. Anyway, so Lakers went 4-3 and three on their road trip. That's actually pretty decent considering they didn't have LeBron and AD. And they also didn't have other players like... I th- don't think they had Kyle Kuzma on, with, on a few of their games. And then Wes Matthews was kind of out. Uh, but... The ma- the fact that the Lakers managed to pull off some impressive victories was quite good, if you ask me. Like they beat the Nets. I know. Like, again, I know the Nets had like I think they had KD on a on a minutes restriction, and then Kyrie kind of got thrown out. And I don't think they had James Harden. It just saying. Like I'm I'm actually yeah they had Kevin Durant on a minutes restriction, but he put it in 22 points. And then Kyrie had 18 before he got tossed. And and the Nets have some pretty solid players. They have Blake Griffin, and they had LaMarcus Aldridge, who put in 12 points, which is actually pretty good. Um, some unfortunate news regarding LaMarcus Aldridge is that he unfortunately medically retired because of an irregular heartbeat. I actually feel bad, and I wish him the best going forward, and... I wish him happy retirement. I remember LaMarcus's days when he was... I think he won a ring with the Spurs, if I'm not mistaken. I remember him when he was with Portland, for the most part. But he was a good player. I liked his gameplay. So, I wish you nothing but the best going forward, LaMarcus. So, um, Anyway, back to the Lakers-Nets game. Uh, I, I also did hear that Dennis Schroeder and Kyrie both got ejected just because Schroeder said a word that I won't be saying on the air. Um, I will say this about Schroeder, Art Schroeder. I don't think it was good that he used the word. I know he was just, he was trying to be tough, but I don't think it was, he was, he, he was in the right place to use that word. Like the word that I'm describing is the word that never, ever, 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 ever should be used. Whether it's, no matter what ethnicity you are, or no matter what person you are, even if you're an ice cream man, you shouldn't be saying that. So, yeah, Schroeder and Kyrie both got tossed. I'm surprised the NBA didn't crack down on them. Maybe they find Kyrie and Schroeder, but either way, I'm not going to get too much into it, just because. I was going to say that they should at least kiss and make up, because, come on, life is too short to be getting angry at one another and i'm sure schroeder didn't mean it i'm sure he was just trying to be tough and funny but i'm just saying (laughs) anyway so back to the lakers the lakers are still in fifth place in the western conference which i guess is cool but i'm i'm not getting fully worried and i think that they'll still be fine going into
going forward, especially when they did get the news that Anthony Davis did get cleared for like contact practices. And that just means that Anthony Davis is getting closer and closer to returning. I I did hear that Anthony Davis was supposed to return in two weeks, and then LeBron was supposed to return in three weeks. I don't know if this was last week, but Anthony Davis is just getting closer and closer to returning. Same with LeBron. And then LeBron, AD, Andre Drummond, Kyle Kuzma, KCP, Dennis Schroeder, Montrez Harrell, Wes Matthews. The world is the Lakers' oyster, and... That's going to make Lakers a deadly team. Like when it comes to postseason time, I am really looking forward to it to seeing the Lakers full roster. But as of right now, the Lakers have a lot of tough matchups ahead. On Saturday, they play the Utah Jazz, and I think Mark Gasol is questionable for that game because he had a pinky injury. And it's unlike the injury that Kobe had, the late Kobe Bryant had when he dislocated his finger and then he just popped it back in. I think this one's a little bit more concerning for Gasol, but it all depends. Like, I'm surprised Frank Vogel got weirded out. He said that was gross, but it's like, you've never seen Kobe's dislocation of his pinky finger and then he popped it back in. But then again, Vogel hasn't really been around the Lakers too much, and I don't think he really saw Kobe a whole lot in his heyday back when he was with Indiana. So we'll see. So the Lakers not only play the Jazz on Saturday, they play the Jazz on Monday, which both games are going to be televised nationally on ESPN, which is awesome. Then the Lakers get the televised treatment against the Dallas Mavericks as they travel to the American Airlines Arena to face the Dallas Mavericks. They play them on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, and they also play the Mavericks next Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. So the Lakers have quite a bit of a challenge on their hands. But it kind of gets... The schedule kind of gets a little bit lighter for them after they face the Mavericks. But the Jazz and the Mavericks are both two tough teams. Like, the Jazz are obviously having the season of their lives. They're having an outstanding season. While the Lakers are having a season where, well, 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 no. The Mavs are having a pretty decent season as well. Like, they're in the uh, borderline of making the playoffs. Like, the Mavericks are currently seventh, and they still have... They still have that uh, one guy on their team, Nick Luka Doncic. Yeah, the I'm surprised he's six seven. He looks way taller than six seven, if you ask me. They have Luka Doncic. They have Kristaps Porzingis. They have Josh Richardson, who has been a tr- tremendous surprise. They also have JJ Redick, who they just recently signed, though he's up there in age. They have Trey Burke and. And the list goes on and on. Tim Hardaway Jr., Maxi Kleber. So the Mavs are going to be a tough tough matchup for the Lakers, especially since they're number seven. Where And the whole play-in game thing is a thing where the seven versus ten seed plays one another and then the eight versus nine seed plays one another for a spot to get into the actual playoffs. So there's that. So the Lakers do have their hands full this week, but I'm not fully worried that the Lakers... I don't think the Lakers will lose all four matchups, but I will say this. I at least least can see them taking at the most two. If they take three, awesome. But they're going to need to do a lot if they want to take two games against the Jazz and or the Mavericks. So... There's that right there. So that's going to do it for the Lakers. Let's go to the Clippers now. So the Clippers are still going strong. Like, they barely beat the Pistons on Wednesday, 100-98. to They beat the Pacers, 126-115. to They beat the Pistons on Sunday, 131-124. to And then they beat the Rockets, 126-109. to They also beat the Suns last Thursday, 113 to 103. So the Clippers have been really have really been going strong. They're only two games back of Phoenix and they've won seven in a row. So I think this is the team that everyone seems to forget that is hot. However, the 
Clippers have themselves a tough game tonight against the Philadelphia 76ers. They play at 4 p.m. Pacific time. It's going to be in Philly. Sunday, the Clippers play the Minnesota Timberwolves, which shouldn't be too big, bad of a matchup. I think the T, they, the Clippers can handle the T-Wolves. Next Tuesday, the Clippers play the Trailblazers, which could be a, a potential first-round opponent for the Clips. And then next Wednesday, the Clippers face Memphis at Staples Center. And then next Friday, the Clippers face the Rockets. So Clippers have, from now until next Friday, the Clippers have such a busy schedule. But but I will also say this, the Clippers are still, they're still boasting quite a good roster. Even without Kawhi, like Paul George has been really stepping up and Bless his soul. Like, that dude has been doing really good in the regular season. Nick Batum's also stepped up, but they did lose Patrick Beverly, as I think he's out with, like, a finger injury. He's out four to three to four weeks, I want to say. So, not having Patrick Beverly is a huge loss, but I think the Clippers will be fine. They have proven they can win without him. They've won seven in a row. And they also have Serge Ibaka doing big things. Marcus Morris has been doing well. Rajon Rondo has been coming up big. Ivaka Zubak has been decent. Um, speaking of big man, the Clippers just re-signed DeMarcus Cousins to another, yes, another 10-day contract. So good stuff for Boogie Cousins. And here's hoping the Clippers can take care, take good care of him. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with the Clippers, but I'm liking the Clippers as of right now. Like, they're doing pretty good, but the big question always still remains, can they have success in the postseason? Because it seems like every year they have great success in the regular season, and then when it comes postseason, they turn into a pumpkin and they wind up losing in no better than the second round. Like, I think the Clippers have what it takes to be one of the true to be a championship contender, but it seems like they always find a way to revert into pumpkin mode when it comes to certain parts of the NBA playoffs. As I've, I've beaten this dead horse many times until I see the Clippers getting past the second round. I don't want anyone discussing Clippers and NBA champions or even Western conference champions. So there's that right there. We'll see. Hey, Marcus, he says, shout out to the hardest working man at IE Sports Radio. I appreciate you, my brother, and I appreciate listening to your show, Gloves Off, even when I'm busy. Like, I actually listened to Gloves Off when I was walking home from work. I didn't even have headphones in. I didn't need headphones. If people were judging me on what I was listening to, I did not care because I was listening to my brother, Marcus. But thank you, Marcus. I, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> uh... All right, but that's going to do it for the NBA. That's going to do it for for mostly basketball. So I'm actually going to shift gears a little. I would go to NHL, but looking at the NHL standings, well, I will say this. Kings Avalanche did get postponed, so unfortunate for Kings fans. But the Kings and the Ducks are, are still at the bottom of the Western Conference. So I'm just going to skip over that. I'll get into that a little bit later, but I actually do want to talk some NCAA volleyball. I know I talk about that on set point quite a bit. Hey, set point. None of that. <laughs> but there were some Western Com- there were some Southern California teams in the NCAA women's volleyball tournament. And three of which actually won a NCAA tournament game. So UCLA, San Diego, and Pepperdine all were in the NCAA tournament in terms of women's volleyball. UCLA beat Ryder in the first round very convincingly. San Diego defeated... I forget... Uh-oh, I actually forgot who they beat in the first round. I think it was like Texas A&M Christian Corpus, if I'm not mistaken. It was some team that I I've never even heard of. Yeah, Texas A&M Corpus Christian. So San Diego defeated San Yeah, San Diego defeated Texas A&M CC in three sets. 
And then Pepperdine defeated UMBC in three sets in the first round. And keep in mind, the NCAA tournament was a 48-team bracket as opposed to the traditional 64-team bracket. I already spoke on what I think about the traditional or the uh, 48-team bracket versus the 64-team bracket. I personally don't like it, but that's just me. You can go listen to the uh, previous episode of Set Point that's available, and this week's episode of Set Point, or next week's episode of Set Point, will be on Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So there's that right there. But back to the NCAA Women's Volleyball Tournament. So UCLA advanced to the second round, or the round of 32, where they faced BYU. And unfortunately for me, I actually had UCLA winning against BYU. But BYU actually beat UCLA. You would think BYU has learned their lesson when it comes to facing UCLA in the postseason. But I guess they did. BYU swept UCLA, which was absolutely disappointing. In the second set, UCLA led 24-19, to and what happened was UCLA allowed five straight points to allow BYU to tie the set at 24-24. Oh, but it gets better. UCLA had nine set points. Nine set points. And what happened was BYU took the second set 31 to 29. How do you have nine set points and you lead 24 to 19 and you wind up losing the set? UCLA is so much better than that. UCLA has one of the best players in the nation in Mac May. I know they've had some injuries to deal with, but I don't get it. Like, UCLA... (sighs) No wonder UCLA wasn't (laughs) seeded. Oh, my brother. UCLA got swept... Eventually got swept by BYU. They dropped the third set. All the momentum was with BYU. I think UCLA led in the first set as well, and then they wound up losing that set to BYU, so... Oh, BYU. Good for you, though, BYU. BYU was the only West Coast Conference team to advance out of the round of 32. The other two West Coast Conference teams, San Diego and Pepperdine, kind of didn't advance. So looking at San Diego's matchup against Louisville, San Diego actually came out blistering hot in the first set as they won the first set, I think it was 25-14, to They dominated that first set. And second set was almost looking like San Diego was going to take that set, but... Louisville managed to grind it out and win set two, twenty-five to twenty-three. The third set, Louisville won the third set twenty. I think it was twenty-five to seventeen. I'm I'm not looking at the set scores, but I know Louisville qu- took the third set quite convincingly. Now the fourth set, San Diego was leading throughout the most part, and then San Diego led twenty-one to eighteen. I'm like, okay, this one's gonna go five. <sighs> no, it didn't. Louisville was able to claw their way back into the fourth set, and they tied it at 23-23. And it was just like the UCLA-BYU second set, except it didn't go to 30 points. Louisville was able to take the fourth set 29-27 to and the match as Louisville knocked off San Diego, and Louisville will advance to the second or to the round of 16 or the sweet 16 where they will face Washington. I'm not that surprised that Louisville beat San Diego. San Diego has been, was utterly inconsistent, especially in the last six matches of the regular season as they lost four out of those six, which cost them the West coast conference championship. But I am also surprised San Diego didn't force a fifth set. I thought it was at least going to go five, but San Diego really disappointed. Like, it's all about closing out matches or closing out sets, and San Diego just didn't do that, and it's disappointing. But I think the Toreros will be back next year. But I'll save that talk for volleyball on Monday when it comes to set point. So now let's jump over to Pepperdine. After Pepperdine beat UMBC, they got to face Baylor. This was actually the second meeting between Pepperdine and Baylor. The first set, Baylor won the first set 
25 to 21. Second set, Pepperdine woke up and grinded out, winning the second set and won it 25 to 22. The third set, Pepperdine came out hot as they led 5 to 1, and I believe they led by as many as 8. And unlike San Diego and UCLA, they actually held on to win that. Or actually, no, they they dominated that third set and they won that third set 25 to 17. They got a lot of good contributions from their players, such as Shannon Scully, Ali O'Hara, Rachel Aherns, Meg Brown. It was just something great. It was a thing of beauty if you're a Pepperdine fan. The fourth set, it looked as if BYU, or not BYU, Baylor was going to run away with it as. They actually led through, for the most part in set four, and then in in the latter part of set number four, Pepperdine actually tied it. And they eventually tied it at twenty four to twenty four after Baylor led twenty four to twenty two, and it was just back and forth action until Yasonia Presley of Baylor just straight up dominated, and Baylor took the fourth set twenty seven to twenty five. And I was I wasn't too surprised that that Pepperdine lost that fourth set, but I know you can never keep Baylor out of... Baylor is never out of it against, like, common opponents. Like, against teams like Texas and whatnot, like, that, those are the teams that you're comfortable with. So, that you should be comfortable of counting Baylor out. So, fifth set, it was tight throughout the, the first part of the, of the fifth set. And then... Baylor just pulled away. They had got some great contributions from not only Yasonia Presley, but other players such as Kara McGee and Lauren Sanders. And eventually Baylor just won that fifth set 15 to 10. And that was it for Pepperdine season. So unfortunately there are no Southern, no more Southern California teams in the NCAA women's volleyball tournament, which really sucks. All of them got bounced in the second round. Or round of 32. Excuse me for saying second round. But it was still a solid season for San Diego, Pepperdine, and UCLA. I thought UCLA was at least going to crack Sweet 16. Just because they faced a young BYU team. I thought BYU was... Because BYU only has two seniors and they have two juniors. But they managed to turn the tables on everyone and they grew up quite quickly. I don't know how BYU is going to handle Wisconsin, though. Like either way, I think UCLA, UCLA basically had the option of losing in the Sweet 16 or losing in the round of 32, and UCLA took the the uh, second option. So it's quite the bummer, but it is what it is. And part of me was kind of rooting for Pepperdine, but I knew for a fact that Pepperdine was going to need to play some near perfect volleyball if they wanted to defeat Baylor, but that's not the case. Either way, that's going to close the book for NCAA Women's Volleyball. I'll be talking more about NCAA Women's Volleyball and all things volleyball on set point on Monday, so definitely tune in. All right, so that's that for NCAA Women's Volleyball. I won't get into NCAA Men's Volleyball just because, like, I'll be saving that for, for set point. I will make note that UCLA's beach volleyball team is number one, still number one in the NCAA or the ABCA coaches polls, which I still think the beach volleyball championship is up for grabs between UCLA, USC, Florida State, and LSU. Heck, even LMU could maybe win the NCAA championship. It'd be quite something if they did. So there's that right there, but. That's enough volleyball talk for a little while. I said one time on on the show that I would only be talking about college sports and college sports from Southern California if they were in like the thick of it when it comes to like their season, other than like men's basketball or women's basketball or football and whatnot. I know I'm boring, but it would make this show go on longer than it needs to be if I talked about every Southern California college sport. And that's not including Division Two and Division Three and and NAIA or Junior College. So there's that. Who Nelly? But that's gonna do it for the college portion of the show. I may talk some more college sports in a little bit, but 
It's not possible. So now let's jump back into the NHL. So Ducks and Kings are still at the bottom of the Western Conference. So recapping the Ducks this week, on Wednesday on and on Monday, the Ducks actually won games. Surprise, surprise. The Ducks beat the Sharks 4-1 to one on Wednesday, and they beat the Sharks 4 to nothing on Monday. And then they lost to the Colorado Avalanche 4-1 to one on Sunday. And then last Friday, they lost to the Avalanche 2 to nothing. The Ducks play the Vegas Golden Knights tonight and on Sunday. And then on Tuesday, the Ducks and the Kings face one another. And then next Saturday, the Ducks and the Golden Knights face one another. So there's that for the Ducks this week for this upcoming week. The Kings play the Avalanche, but unfortunately that game is postponed. Both games are of the Avalanche versus the Kings are postponed, which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. It must be something COVID related, unfortunately. It doesn't give the the reason why, but it is what it is. I, I maybe I'll be able to find it, but and it doesn't say it on the ESPN app. So anyway, so on Tuesday Kings play the Ducks at Staples Center. That's going to be a fun matchup, even though it's the battle of the last place teams in the Western in the Western Division. <laughs> I hate to say that, but it is true. And then next Friday, the Kings stay at Staples Center to face the Minnesota Wild. And then next Saturday, the Kings face the Arizona Coyotes. And then the following Monday, April 26th, the Kings and the Ducks face one another. And then April... Actually, believe it or not, the Kings and the Ducks face each other four times from April 26th all the way to May the 1st. So... That'll be for, like, a later... That'll probably be for, like, next week's show. If not the following week. So... That's gonna be some fun times right there for the Kings and the Ducks. Even though both teams are pretty mediocre this year it's sad honestly but that's just how life is so there's that and i want i want the ducks or kings to be somewhat competitive like it sucks seeing them struggle year after year but that's the life of of a hockey fan at least san jose has is into the 40 point range but san jose is southern is not southern california they're northern california so there's that. And that's enough hockey talk for that for uh, that time. Um, I'll actually take myself a quick little commercial break. When we come back, we'll be discussing some MLB talk, and then we'll also be discussing some MLS talk. The MLS season is vastly approaching, and we'll see where the Galaxy and and the and LAFC have to get to play this year but we'll see you're listening to the socal supreme sports show here on i sports radio your direct feed for all that is sports Hey sports fans, do you like wine? Well, we've got the show for you. This is Let's Wine About Sports, a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously. From the classic Cabernet Sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before. Oh yeah, we cover it all. And we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well. Football, hockey, collegiate, women's sports, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it all and we're going to whine about it all. So join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports.
Ladies and gentlemen, hear me and hear me good. If you like sports, then you like the Wait a Minute Show. If you like comedy, then you like the Wait a Minute Show. If you like a different opinion coming from a different angle, then you like the Wait a Minute Show. So join me Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with your host, Jelani J.B. Bowden. And of course, my man Lopan on the Wait a Minute Show. A section all sports fans. If you're someone who wakes up each morning with a list of sporting events to go along with your to do list for the day, then you just might be a diehard. The world of sports is as vast as the ocean is deep, including the major leagues, the minor leagues, the college, and everything in between. This is me, your brother, Larry B of IE Sports Radio, welcoming you to join me every Monday evening at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on The Defining Moment, a show that focuses on what really matters in the sports world, sports themselves, and nothing outside of them. Once again, tune in for The Defining Moment with me, your brother, Larry B, every Monday evening at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on IE Sports Radio, right here on Spreaker.com. We'll see you there. And we're back with the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, back with Segment 2. You can check out all of our amazing shows on IE Sports Radio. You heard some drops such as Let's Whine About Sports with Mike Pat. Also, for those that are wondering, if you have a mock draft for the up-and-coming NFL draft, and you want to see if you can predict the draft correctly for the most part send it off to Mike Pat Mike Pat's Twitter is at Mike Pat 91 and then you could also email it to him but it would be nice if you actually uh, just added him on Twitter and and or follow him on Twitter and then just messaged him and just said hey here's my mock draft and then if you win you basically get some sort of prize, such as so I think you get like a t-shirt, if I'm not mistaken, or no, no, now I remember the prize. A shout-out from every show, not just this show, but from but for every show. So, I know that sounds a little cheesy, but it's, it's good, good praise, and it's good praise, because not many can come close to predicting the the watch the N- NFL draft correctly cuz it takes a lot of of wisdom to like correctly predict it. Obviously many people can just look on teams needs and then say, "Oh wait, they need this guy and then they need this guy and then we'll take this 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 this." But it takes a lot of bravery and confidence to predict which one which team will draft which player. So there's that. Anyway, you also can check out Larry's 30 shows such as Defining Moment, 3 and Out College Edition, Sports Couple Perspective, 3 and Out. The list goes on and on. And you can check out all of our shows. We have many different varieties of shows such as boxing slash MMA, basketball, soccer, even volleyball courtesy of yours truly. Like, the list goes on and on, and iSports Radio is going to continue to go. We also have other regional shows as well, such as we have a Pittsburgh show, we have a Philly show, we have a Ohio show, courtesy of Andrew Hagenball, which is going to be coming on in T-minus one hour and five minutes. So definitely check out the State of Ohio Sports with Andrew Hagenball. And also we have an indie show, and we also have a show dedicated to motorsports, so iSports Radio continues to grow, and we are not going to stop growing. Like, the sky is our limit. So there's that little spiel right there, but back to segment number two of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Let us get into some baseball action between the Angels, Padres, and Dodgers. 
So I know I said I was going to talk about the MLS coming up, but I, I think it's good to talk about some Angels action. So the Angels, after their promising start, kind of cooled off, which is disappointing. Like, this past week, the Angels faced the Kansas City Royals at Kansas City, and they lost two of three. They lost the first, or no, the Angels won the first game 10-3, to which they exploded in the ninth inning in terms of runs. And then on Tuesday, the Royals defeat the Angels 3-2 to two because the Angels don't know the terminology of bullpen management, and they also don't know the terminology of run support. And then the Angels also lost to the Royals 6-1, to one, which was a complete atrocity. The Angels took two of three against the Blue Jays, the Toronto Blue Jays. One of their games in their then four-game series, unfortunately, got postponed due to weather. In the first game between the Angels and the Blue Jays, the Angels won 7-5 to last Thursday. Last Friday, the Angels beat the Blue Jays 7-1. to And then on last Saturday, the Angels got blown out against the Blue Jays, losing 15-1, to which was completely sad face for Angels fans. But the Blue Jays are good, despite their their sluggish start to their season. So, anyway, this weekend, the Angels have a three-game series against the Minnesota Twins at Angel Stadium. It's good to see the Angels back at home. I think they can handle the Twins, but they just can't underestimate them, considering the Twins are still a pretty good team. Like, the Twins have recently struggled, and it's quite sad, actually. Tonight, the Angels will have Alex Cobb against J.A. Happ. I hope the Angels can excel as the Twins actually won yesterday 4-3 against the Boston Red Sox. And the Red Sox won the first three games 4-2 in Game 1. And then the doubleheader, the Red Sox won 3-2. And then the Red Sox won the second of the doubleheader, winning 7-1. I honestly hate the doubleheader rule. It's only seven innings as opposed to nine innings. I guess that's to like make games shorter or it's to give players more rest, but that's basically high school rules. giving Or high school format, where it's basically nine innings. Like I don't even think colleges do that sort of thing. I know colleges, some colleges like the NCAA have mercy rules now because I don't know if most people know this but the NCAA has implemented a 10 run mercy rule so I guess that's a thing right there but it's also something like make the games a little bit more shorter because many people complain and say oh baseball's too long well I say boulder dash I kind of think that's that's a little eh if you ask me it's an eh decision but it is what it is. So the Angels play the Twins on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The Angels will stay at Angel Stadium when, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as they have a three-game series against the Texas Rangers, which the Rangers have, are basically on the level of Minnesota. They've been struggling, but they're kind of mid-tier. And then... Thursday, next Friday, next Saturday, and next Sunday, the Angels travel down to Houston to face the Houston Astros, which currently in the standings, the Angels are 7-5. and five. They are a half a game back of Seattle. Yes, I can't believe I'm actually saying that. The Seattle Mariners are leading the AL West, which, oh boy. The entire AL West has kind of been up and down. Like, the Angels were looking promising, and then, unfortunately, they faltered. That that series against the Royals really hurt them. I kind of have myself to blame because I was kind of flexing on the Kansas City Shuffles chat room saying, how about the Angels? Uh, I gotta learn to keep my mouth shut. Anyway, yeah, definitely do check out the Kansas City Shuffle every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 6 p.m. Central Time. But back to the, the Angels. The Angels are still off to a solid start. They actually were 7 and 3 which was very good which was one of their best I think it's still their best start 
after the first 10 games of the season. Unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be for 8-3. and three. So, Angels have got a lot of work to do still. Their pitching needs to still be crisp and clean. The Angels still need to also provide run support for their team, especially in the latter part of games. Like, if they get more run support in that second game against Kansas City, they actually beat the Royals. Like, And that could also be said for their game against the White Sox, which they lost to back in the... C- season opening series and then that one game against the Astros where the Astros and Angels were tied at 2-2 going into the ninth inning where the Astros managed to get a two-run homer from Carlos Correa uh gosh dang it and still the ninth inning has been the Angels boogeyman for the most part because the Angels really struggle with that when it comes to like most of their games and it's quite saddening honestly Like, I know the Angels are better than this, and their Angels are proving quite nicely. The problem is, they just can't seem to close the deal. So there's that. But, Rome isn't built in a day, a house isn't built in a day, so I gotta be patient with the Angels. At least they're doing solid in the AL West. They are one of two teams that have, that has a record above 500, so there's that. Anyway, moving on to the Dodgers, which is the only team, I think they are the only team, yes, they are the only team in the MLB to have 10 plus wins, so good for the Dodgers. They have 11 wins and they only have two losses. Miles will go over the match, the games they won. They have been on a roll. Their, their past two series is they've posted sweeps, like this past Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the Dodgers beat the Colorado Rockies 7 to nothing. That was on Tuesday. On Wednesday, the Dodgers beat the Rockies 4-2. to And then on Thursday, the Dodgers beat the Rockies 7-5. to On, on yeah, last, last Sunday, Saturday, and Friday, the Dodgers beat, swept the Nationals. Last Friday, the Dodgers beat the Nationals 1-0. to While last Saturday, the Dodgers beat the Nationals 9-5. to And then on Sunday, or last Sunday... The Dodgers beat the Nationals 3 nothing. So, in other words, they held the, Na- the Nationals to only five runs within three games. And they shut them out in two of those games. So, Dodgers are looking good to start. Their true challenge starts this weekend. As, starting tonight, the Dodgers travel down to Petco Park to face the San Diego Padres. And it's a three-game series, and that's going to be the first of three intense battles between the Padres and the Dodgers, because those are the two heavyweights that's based that could win the the National League and the NL West in general. But that's pretty much a step down. So, outside of the Padres series, the Dodgers also have a two-game series against the Seattle Mariners on Monday and Tuesday, and then. Next week, the Dodgers have a four-game series at Dodger Stadium against the Padres starting starting next Thursday and ending the following Saturday or next Saturday. So that's also going to be the series of the week, and and the Dodgers and the Padres are also going to be on on ESPN next Sunday. So that's going to be some fun times for the Dodgers versus the Padres. And... Personally, I have a soft spot for the Padres. I want them to actually do good because the city of San Diego deserves a champion. After the Chargers up and left and the San Diego fleet became no more in the AAL, AAF, I think it's the Amer. I, I think that's what that football league was called, but it's the San Diego fleet. So there's that. And then also, San Diego hasn't really had a true pro sports team other than the Chargers and whatnot. So here's hoping the Padres can actually win a World Series this year. I have a soft spot for them, but it's going to be tough, especially without Fernando Tatis Jr., who hurt his shoulder. And I don't know what the whereabouts of him are. I want to say he's still out. Either way, uh, going to the Padres, they actually... They actually had quite the week last week. Um, 
this past week uh, or this in their most recent series, they actually split the series against the Pittsburgh Pirates. On Monday, they beat the Pirates six to two in Game One. On Tuesday, the Pirates beat the Padres eight to t- eight to four in Game Two. On Wednesday, in Game Three, the Pirates beat the Padres five to one. And then on Thursday, the Padres beat the Pirates, salvaging the split eight to three in Game Four. So, last Friday. The Padres actually made history as Joe Musgrove, a San Diego native who is a San Diego boy, which is basically exactly what I said when it comes to a San Diego native, pitched the Padres' first no-hitter in the history of his team, in the history of San Diego Padres. Absolutely amazing. And it was almost a complete game until one base runner made it his way to first base, which it sucks, but it is what it is. At least it's it's if it wasn't for an, an error on the Padres part, that would have been a complete game, which would have been absolutely amazing. But the Padres did get the no hitter from Joe Musgrove and they beat the 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 uh, Texas Rangers three to nothing last Friday. And that to me deserves a tip of the cap. And some applause. So yeah, that's absolutely amazing seeing a no-hitter. Whether it's... And I personally love no-hitters. Whether it's in Little League, whether it's in high school baseball, whether it's in college baseball, whether it's in the minor leagues, whether it's in the major leagues, whether it's in Olympic baseball, a no-hitter is absolutely amazing. Again, had it been a complete game, it would have been outstanding. Unfortunately, that was not the case, and San Diego is going to have to settle for the no-hitter, but that's just as good. Speaking of the Padres and their series last week against the Rangers, the Padres swept their series last week against the Rangers as they took Game 1 3 to nothing, courtesy of the no-hitter. Last Saturday, the Padres beat the Rangers 7-4, to and then on Sunday, the Padres shut out the Rangers yet again, beating them 2 to nothing. though it wasn't a no-hitter, but still, it was a shutout. So, absolutely amazing for the Padres, and it looks like they're starting to pick up some steam going forward as... As Manny Machado has stepped up, and still no Fernando Tatis Jr. I don't know if he's going to be playing this series. If that's the case, I don't think he'll be playing this series. But going forward with the Padres, they do have that three-game series against the Dodgers starting on Friday and ending on Sunday. And then on Monday through Wednesday, the Padres have a three-game homestand against the Milwaukee Brewers. The Brewers have been okay this season. They're 7-5, and five, but they have room to grow. The Brewers and Padres face each other on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then on Thursday, Friday, or next Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the Padres face the Dodgers in a four-game series at Dodger Stadium, a.k.a. the Chavez Ravine. And I totally messed, it, that, messed that one up. Let's try this again. The Chavez Ravine. That's a little bit better. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's going to be that's gonna be a very fun series. Like, this series and the next series, or this week's series against the Dodgers and Padres, and next week's series against the Dodgers and Padres is going to be very, 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 fun. You get what I mean? It's going to be a very fun series, and that could be a preview of maybe more things to come when it comes to the Dodgers and the Padres. Like, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the Padres can do against the Dodgers. And I'm looking to, looking forward to seeing if the Dodgers can actually hold their own against the Padres. Even though the Padres won't have Fernando Tatis, they still have to deal with Manny Machado, which is a former Dodger, and that's going to be fun to deal with, I guess. But but it, it is going to be a, gr- a great time. I really am looking forward to that. Looking forward to that series between the Dodgers and the Padres. And I think 
it's it's not going to fall short of anything excite of anything exciting. But everyone else is going to have to step up for the Padres now that Tatis is not hitting. So it's it's going to have to be all kinds of players, such as Trent Grisham. And then also they have to have Jerks and Profar stepping up. It can't just be Manny Machado. So there's that. So let's actually look ahead to the uh, Dodgers-Padres series. So look at the Dodgers-Padres series for tonight. The pitchers are Walker Bueller for the Dodgers and Ryan Weathers for the Padres. As we say hello to Larry B, thank you for popping in the chat room, my brother. Hope everything is going well. So Ryan Weathers for the Padres and Walker Bueller for the Dodgers. So game two will have Clayton Kershaw against Yu Darvish. Ooh, that's that's gonna be a fun matchup. Especially since Yu Darvish was a former Dodger himself, so the former the former student gets to face the current master. As Larry says, he just got hired for a second job. Hey, that is awesome, brother. That is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Great job, Larry. I... That is absolutely awesome, though. I'm glad. I'm happy for you, Larry. I really am. And great congratulations on getting your on on getting your second job. I couldn't be more proud of you. So anyway, back to the Dodgers and Padres. So game three for the Dodgers and the Padres will include Trevor Bauer and Blake Snell. Funny thing is, is that those two actually signed to their respective teams in the off season. So. It all comes full circle. And I like the game, too, a uh, little... I like these uh, matchups. Like, Kershaw versus Darvish? Like, yeah. And Larry says, I appreciate your hard work keeping I Sports Radio going in this tough time. Hey, I appreciate it. Hey, no problem, Larry. Like, I got your back. So, there's that right there. But back to the Dodgers and Padres... Kershaw versus Darvish in Game 2 is going to be really fun. And then and then Bauer versus Snell in Game 3 is going to be also pretty awesome as well. So I can't wait for it. I really want to get a glimpse of it. But with the NCAA Women's Volleyball Tournament going on, as well as all things other sports going on, it's going to be a lot. But then again, iSports Radio is your direct feed for all that is sports, and there's no doubt about it. So, there's that. But, looking, but that's pretty much it for the Dodgers and Padres. For the Angels, I might as well look at their little preview for their games. So, game one for the Angels, Andrew Heaney is going to be on the bump, while Lewis Thorpe is going to be on the bump for the Twins. On Saturday, the Angels will have Jose Quintana against Matt Schumacher. And then on Sunday, the Angels will have Alex Cobb, and he'll go up against J.A. Happ. So, cross my fingers and hoping for the best for the Angels. If they can take two of three from the Twins, that would be grand, considering that'll help them make up some ground, because... I don't know the standings in, or I don't know which team is playing which when it comes to, like, the Brewers, or not the Brewers, the Mariners and the Astros, but, again, this isn't, this is the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, not the Seattle Sports Show or the Houston Sports Show. (laughs) Uh, But I might as well check out who the Astros and Mariners are facing. And surprisingly enough, the Astros and Mariners are facing each other this weekend. So it's tough to decide who you want to see win or lose when you're the angels. Like, do you want to see the Mariners win and lose their lead in the AL West? Or do you want to see the Astros lose because the Astros can we hope for a tie? (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, But the Mariners also do play the Dodgers next week on Monday and Tuesday. And then Next Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the Mariners face the Boston Red Sox. So there's that. The Astros, after their series against the 
Mariners face the Colorado Rockies in a two-game series, and then the Astros face the Angels in Houston for a four-game series. So it's crucial times for the Angels. So they really got to beat up on these teams that they know they can beat up on, which means they got to beat the the Rangers and they got to beat the struggling Twins because if not, then winning could come tough going forward. But I'm confident in the Angels. They just got to put together the full package. That's just my thing. So we'll see. We'll see. So anyway, that's enough talk for the for the Angels, Dodgers, and Padres. Adam Carnick pops in the chat room and says, Afternoon, Taryn. I'm off work. And the Cubs really aren't worth listening to. <laughs> ah, poor Cubbies. At least you still have the White Sox, hopefully. So anyway, let's jump to some MLS action. I haven't been paying too much attention, but I did hear that the LAFC and the LA Galaxy have released their schedules. So the first game of the season for LAFC is Saturday. That's going to be against Austin. I didn't even know Austin Austin FC. I didn't even know Austin had a team. I guess they're like a new expansion team. This is kind of news to me, but LAFC against Austin is going to be pretty fun. So and Adam says the White Sox got snowed out in Boston. Oh yeah, I for I actually remembered that. I just remembered that, but uh uh, yeah, the Sox and the Sox won't be facing each other because of snow. So there's that. So the so back to LAFC. The LAFC plays Austin tonight or tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific time at Austin. So LAFC is basically going to be making history as they'll be Austin FC's first ever opponent. Good for LAFC. Um. Anyway, LAFC also well that's the only their only game for this week. Next week LAFC plays Seattle, which is going to be really fun. I think that's gonna, I think that's actually a rematch of their of their matchup back in back last season in the in the uh, MLS playoffs. So, there's that right there for LAFC and I I want to see LFC actually do something. If LFC is actually gonna imp- gonna really thinks they're the best team in LA, I want to see them actually win or actually attempt to like advance. Like, I I don't know much about soccer. I'm not the biggest soccer guy, but all I know is that LFC hasn't won Jack Dudley's squad, and they didn't even win their little their little crossover play against Tigres. So there's that. Anyway, that's enough about LAFC. So let's move on to the LA Galaxy. So the Galaxy also are making history of their own as they play Miami on Sunday. And that's actually going to be televised nationally. That's a noon Pacific time start. And they're playing on ABC. So I want to say this is that's going to be Miami's first game. Yeah, Miami is going to have their first uh, game Oh, no, it's not their first game, but it's Inter-Miami CF. So so unlike Austin, it's not going to be Miami's first ever MLS game. But still, it's going to be a fun matchup between Miami and the Galaxy. Finally, another Miami versus LA matchup that's not the Heat versus the Lakers. <laughs> uh. So next Sunday, the Galaxy face the New York Red Bulls at 2.30 p.m. It's going to be at New York, so cool beans right there. LAFC and LA Galaxy face each other on Saturday, May 8th, which I wish they had fit. I don't mean to say this in, in a derogatory sort of way, but I wish LAFC and LA Galaxy faced each other on on May 5th, but we can't complain. I guess all the matches are going to be on Saturday and Sunday. So I guess that's worth noting right there. But uh, I am looking forward to the first LAFC versus LA, El Trafico matchup. I was blanking on the uh, name. I'm like, what's that rivalry name called? It's like, oh yeah, El Trafico. Who knows? Maybe I'll be able to call that game if it's being televised nationally. But it's not. So 
But I am looking forward to the LA Galaxy LAFC matchup. I'm looking forward to both of their seasons. I want to see one of those teams actually do well this season. I'm sick and tired of one or the other tripping on themselves in the postseason. Uh, like, I think this past season, in terms of the MLS, LAFC lost in the first round for the first time in, like, forever. I know LAFC is not as old as Ga- the Galaxy is, but it's kind of rare to see LAFC losing in the first round. Like, LAFC, to me, is kind of like that rich kid that has all the toys and fancy money and gadgets and whatnot. I again I'm not I'm no soccer expert but I know LAFC has always been rot, risen to power but the Galaxy have the rings and whatnot in terms of uh history team history and whatnot. So there's that right there. But that's enough MLS talk for me. One more thing I definitely want to make note of before I sign off, and I hope Larry B is listening, is that the high school Football game of the season is tomorrow, and I am super duper excited. So yeah, the high school football game of the year is tomorrow, and I'm excited for it. What high school football game of the year am I talking about? It is between two talented Southern California teams. The first one hails from California. Well, they both hail from California. The first one hails from from Santa Ana. And they are a well-known program. They are and they are head coached by Bruce Rawlinson. That team is none other none other than Modern Day which is mostly good at practically every sport, for the most part. So the second team, in terms of the best Southern California, or the best high school football game of the year, hails from Bellflower. And this team is last year's national champion, and they've created many top players like DJ Ui Ungalale, Josh Rosen, the list goes on and on. This team, the second team, is known as St. John Bosco, which they're kind of good at every sport, sometimes. Anyway, so the Braves and the Monarchs are facing each other in football on Saturday at Santa Ana Stadium. I think I said it was going to be at Bosco, but unfortunately, I said I, I was wrong, and I apologize, but it is going to be at Santa Ana Stadium, and it is being broadcast live on Fox Sports Go, and Larry B said it best, that should be a great game. I agree, and that's basically going to be for the Trinity League title. Like, Bosco is 4-0, Modern Day is 4-0, and I'm really looking forward to it. Like, they have, either team hasn't really been fully challenged. The only true challenge that bo- either team got was from Servite, which... I think many can argue that's probably the third best team in California, if not the fourth best team behind Corona Centennial. But I will say this about Servite. Um, They also closed out their season, finishing third in the Trinity League. They lost to Bosco by by 10 points, while they lost to Modern Day by only seven. So, anyway. So, looking at Modern Day and Bosco, I... Haven't seen both of these teams in action, but I really am excited for those two. Like, I'm glad there was a high school football season. I know there's no playoffs, but I want to see Modern Day and St. John Bosco go down to the wire and basically see what happens with both teams. Because Jason Negro and Bruce Rawlinson are both great coaches. Like, And I have lots of respect for both of them. And I have even met Bruce Rawlinson one time. At a gala. <laughs> but, um, Bosco and Modern Day is going to be a fun little matchup. Like, everyone is hyping this as Game of the Year, and I'm hyping this as Game of the Year. And I hope it does. I hope it's not one sided. Like, the thing I like about big games is that I hope that one of one team of mine comes out on top, or the team that I think comes out on top. But I, I also don't want to see a blow. I don't want to see. 
a one-sided affair because that's what takes the fun out of these intense rivalry games. But I don't think Modern Day and St. John Bosco are going to disappoint. Like, I hear Modern Day has a freshman quarterback, which is quite astounding. And then they've got Division I players all over the place. And believe it or not, there are 59 players in the Modern Day versus St. John Bosco game that are at least a three-star recruit or that at least have one FBS offer. So... I really am excited for that, and I really am looking forward to uh, seeing that. Oh, one more thing about Modern Day and Modern Day's football program is that their freshman team. Now, get this, get this, get this, get this. Everyone, everyone, hold on to your hats, y'all. Okay, so Modern Day's freshman team, their freshman team, last week against Santa Margarita, beat Santa Margarita's JV team. I'm not kidding you. Modern Day's freshman football team defeated Santa Margarita's JV team. I had to take off my glasses and clean them like a couple times. I'm like, wait, hold on. What are we doing? What is this? And I'm just thinking, oh my. And and I even have the tweet pulled up right here. Big congratulations to our freshman team, this is from Modern Day Football, on their win against Santa Margarita's JV team. Another outstanding defensive performance. And the final score was 28 to nothing. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm like, that is, I'm like, I just put down the phone. I just walked away. I just got some fresh air. I'm like, oh, (laughs) And then I just returned back and just looked at the phone again, cleaned my glasses, and said, yep, that's that's correct. Freshman team beat JV team. I'm... Color me surprised. <laughs> oh, boy. I'll just leave it at that. But that is pretty impressive, actually. Uh, Modern Day does have a lot of great coaches. Um... And Adam says, freshman quarterback starting, that's unusual. I agree. I have seen other freshman quarterbacks starting for, like, other high school programs. But but uh, I think for modern day, it's, I think it's kind of usual. Sometimes, like, you never know with Bruce Rawlinson. Sometimes we'll go with freshman quarterbacks. Sometimes we'll go with sophomore quarterbacks. Like, he likes to go young sometimes. Like, if they're performing at a high level, then he'll go with the He'll go with the hottest one that performs well in, like, training camps or, like, passing leagues or whatnot. Um, Another quarterback I do got to mention, and I know I'm bouncing away from the modern-day St. John Bosco matchup, but I am... Another quarterback that deserves a little... That deserves some praise for me is Malachi Nelson of Los Alamitos. Now, for those that have never heard of this kid, you got to hear about it. You got to hear about this kid. This kid has, I want to say he has over 20 Division I offers. 20. Some of them have included USC. Some of them have included Alabama. It's absolutely bonkers. This kid is amazing. And Los Alamitos plays my alma mater, Newport Harbor, tonight. Ooh. And Los Alamitos hasn't lost a game. And in all of Los Alamitos' games this year, they've put up 50 points four out of five times and their only game that they didn't put up 50 was against Edison where they put up 27 that's still quite a bit but anyway yeah that Malachi Nelson his his name is spelled M-A-L-A-C-H-I Malachi and then the word Nelson like this kid is something special, and and he, he's been breaking records. I think in one week against Huntington Beach, where Los Alamitos faced the Oilers, he completed 13 for 13 passes, he had over 300 yards, and he threw like a bunch of touchdowns. I don't know the exact numbers, but that is a school record. I think that's a California record. So whoever lands Malachi Nelson is going to be one great is going to have a stud on their hands. Like 
I'm very excited to see what Malachi Nelson will be able to do for Los Alamos. I just don't want to see him trash Newport Harbor too much. I'm saying that because I'm a homer, but it's going to be a tough one. (laughs) But I guess that's the beauty of facing teams like Los Alamitos, even though they are a league team. So we'll see what Los Alamitos has to offer. I think Los Alamitos is like a top five California team, top five, top 10. And they don't play in a league that's like, that gets a whole lot of love. So there's that. Um, On the topic of like high school football, I, before I end this off, I will say last weekend, I, I actually filmed an absolute thriller of a football game. I actually filmed highlights. I, I'm a, like every Friday, and or or on my downtime, I like to film like I film high school football for like the for kids that want to get like recognized from colleges, and I filmed a quintuple overtime game last week. I filmed an, a, a game that went five overtimes, five, and I'm like, good God Almighty. It was 21 to 21 at the end of the regulation and then the game went five overtimes. It was absolutely am- it was absolutely amazing. Like that is probably the game of the year. I filmed Corona Del Mar versus Edison. I was filming for CDM and their kids and they're cool they're they're cool people even though they're the rival of my alma mater, but still they're cool people. But I will say this, that that five overtime game is a game that should be game of the year right there for in terms of California. I don't care what anyone says. That five overtime game between Edison and Corona Del Mar, game of the year right there. Unless Modern Day and St. John Bosco go to like 10 overtimes. Then that's game of the year right there. But I've never been in a game that's involved five overtimes. If anyone has been in a game that's involved like multiple overtime games, definitely let me know. Definitely share your experience. You can... Definitely share it to me on either of my Twitter accounts, such as uh, the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, at SoCal Show, I-E-S-R, or you can share it on my personal account, being at Taron Rodriguez one But if you've ever been in a multiple overtime game, whether it's like high school or college, or a game that's just taken like more than three hours, even though I think NFL games are like mostly three hours... Please do share that with me. I, I would definitely love it. It would be absolutely awesome. Because I like see- hearing about other people's stories. It's really awesome. But that's pretty much going to do it for the high school football scene. I don't really talk about it that much. Just because I don't watch too much high school football. Cause, just because I'm filming high school football. Adam says, wait, Taryn, you're bearing the lead. You have downtime? Yes, I have some downtime. Yeah, I I have some downtime, but more times than not, I am working, whether it's for IESR or iSports Radio, whether it's for filming or whether it's covering lacrosse games, high school lacrosse games. So, but every now and then I'll have downtime to, like, see what's going on in the world of SoCal sports and the world of volleyball. So there's that. So, uh, so yeah. But if anyone does have like that experience, a high, a high school, college, or any football experience where they've had to deal with multiple overtime games, or they've had to deal with games that have gone more than three hours or whatnot, definitely let me know. So, so there is that, and that is pretty much going to do it for this episode of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I got through quite a bit talking about the MLS, the NBA, the MLB, the NHL, the NCAA Women's Volleyball Tournament, and some high school football, and I think that's going to be where we call it a day here, because we got another show coming on in less than... 25 minutes as that's going to be the state of Ohio sports show. And it's going to be a great show because Andrew Hagen always does a great job with his show or shows. But anyway, you could follow the SoCal Supreme sports show on Twitter at SoCal show, I E S R. And you can follow me on Twitter at Taryn Rodriguez one, my Twitter 
username is in the description and if you want to say what's up or drop a follow or say hi or do any of that stuff definitely do so and I will I'll most I'll definitely be back next week cuz this is the last week of high school football in California so I'll def it all depends on what time I'll be back but it's looking like I could be back at the regular 5 p.m. slot either way my time might be my time might be starting to clear up. My busyness might be starting to clear up. But without any further delay, and thank you to Larry B, Marcus, and Adam in the chat room. I definitely appreciate y'all for popping in and listening in. But without any further delay, it is time to get on out of here. Because, like I said, in less than 25 minutes, we've got another show going on. You dig? Thank you all once again for tuning in to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you once again to our sponsors, Legacy Financial and SoCal Warriors. We definitely appreciate you because without you, the lights aren't really being on. And we also thank you, the listeners, for tuning in, whether you're listening live or whether you're listening in podcast form. I definitely appreciate you for listening in, taking time out of your day, and tuning into this podcast. Once again, we have ourselves the State of Ohio Sports coming on in about 25 minutes. And we have plenty of other shows going on tomorrow, such as Octane Entertainment and Ring Rambling Radio. For everyone here at IE Sports Radio, this is Taryn Rodriguez signing off. Have yourselves a great rest of the weekend. Enjoy all the sports that's going on. And if you're ever feeling stressed, as my good friend would always say, stay positive and push forward. And remember, SoCal is for SoCal. Peace and blessings, y'all.